Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is our third installment of the DOE Office of Sustainability series, Keeping Sustainability Alive While Inside. We're happy you've joined us on this Friday afternoon. It's hard for me to believe this is week six of us doing this. We've done them every other week, um, and we're really excited for today's lineup. It's going to be as great as ever. Um, and uh, before we get started, I want to just give a special thank you to uh, Park and Lisa Williams and through their connections at Lamont Doherty Earth Institute, Columbia University. That's um, one of the big ways we've been able to get so many of these experts to come and join us. And we're really thankful for that connection and their willingness to set this up for us. Um, so we'll move on into the day. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Thad Copeland. I'll be your host today. I'm the Deputy Director of Sustainability. Uh, and I wanted to also acknowledge that we have a whole team that works on these and behind the scenes today, we have two great producers, Lisa Williams uh, and Eliza Brenman. So we're very thankful for their help that making things run smoothly and you'll hear their voices perhaps throughout the day. Eliza will be queuing up some of the questions, um, Elisa might as well. So if you hear random voices from the background, that's who it is. So we're thankful for them and all of their contributions to today's work. Um, I wanted to move forward now and talk about an exciting new feature we have. As I said, we've been doing this now. This is our third week and we're learning as we go, but a brand new feature uh, that we've discovered in Microsoft Teams is our ability to offer captions, um, which is really great. We know we have uh, in a diversity like New York, a lot of non-native English language speakers, and this is an excellent way for you all to uh, follow along as well. The directions are there on the screen with the best way on how to activate those captions. Um, and also I wanted to say this will be available for download when we're finished. And you can also download the whole presentation with the trend, um, with the captions in any of these languages as well. So we're really pleased about that. Um, as if you've joined us in other weeks, you know a little bit about the flow of this, but basically um, you can be watching this on your phone. You may be, but I wanted to say if you're have the option to join us via computer or laptop. It's just a little bit more functional, especially if you want to participate in our Q&A sessions. Um, and I wanted to flag that as well. So one of the things that makes this so great is there is the opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, there's a Q&A bar that you'll be able to type your name in. We ask that you please type your name. You can have the option of posting as anonymous, but we like to know who we're talking to and who's on the other end. So we really encourage you uh, to be able to do that, and we hope you will. Um, so there'll be at least five minutes, maybe a little bit more at the end of each of these sessions where your questions will uh, be asked to the speakers. Um, looking ahead for today, very excited. So if you've joined us in previous weeks, you know we've delved into a whole range of topics. Uh, across the science spectrum. Today we uh, have experts here with us on bird migration, um, drones, both to study volcanoes and looking at how we're studying uh, the Earth's climate. So really exciting topics um, and I think there's something for everyone for sure. So with that, we'll begin our introduction to our first speaker. Um, her name is Dr. Ruth Oliver. We're very excited to have Ruth with us. She's a postdoctoral scientist from Yale University but with roots at Columbia's Lamont Doherty Institute as well. She'll explain a little bit about that. So we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Ruth Oliver with us. And I just want to say too, I love birds as we've been working from home. There's a bird feeder at my window and I've become more fascinated with these little creatures week after week. So excited to learn from you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um... Yeah, I think I'm also feeling the, uh, you know, being around a lot more and having a lot more time on my hands coming back to birds. So what I was going to talk about today is um, a lot of work I did as part of my dissertation, um, looking at how birds migrate to the Arctic and some of the changes that they're experiencing. And so I'm particularly focused on how we can learn about small birds um, because there's many, many of them, and they're really important to ecosystems around the world, but we have a hard time studying them because of their size. And so I'll talk about some of those challenges and how we've tried to overcome them. But first, I wanted to talk about, um, next slide. I wanted to talk about my path to becoming um, a postdoctoral scientist, which is just a really fancy way of saying I am not in grad school anymore, but I'm also not a professor, <laughs> although I hope to be at some point. Um, but yeah, like Thad said, I did my PhD at Columbia, so a little bit closer probably to most of your homes. And now I'm doing research at Yale, so not too far away. Um, 
And um, but obviously there was a lot of things along the way to get me to Columbia that I thought maybe were worth talking about because I don't think until I was in graduate school that I thought I would ever go to graduate school. Um, and part of that is because I had never met a scientist before and I didn't really know what being a scientist involved. And so I had some impressions of what being a scientist were that prevented me from thinking that it was an option for me. Um, so next slide. So just some um, goofy things that I had in my head that I thought, you know, that's not a job for me or not something that I would ever be capable of doing. And so next slide. Um, yeah, first of all, I thought that you had to have really great grades. I thought you had to be like the top of your class and just obsessed with science and math in order to be successful. And I can tell you right now that I had OK grades, but not great grades, and I certainly was not at the top of my class in any of my science or math classes. In fact, I really preferred English and history and politics through most of middle school and high school. And I had one big goal going into college, which was to never, never take a science or math class again. Um, <laughs> and which is funny to think about now because I really like it and I think I'm pretty good at it. Um, so I think one thing that really held me back is I had never really met a scientist, so I didn't really know what scientists look like. And the images I had in my head are maybe similar to, hopefully not, but maybe similar to what you have. Um, or like people like Albert Einstein and this goofy cartoon here, I thought you had to be like an old man with crazy white hair working in a lab coat. And I just, I didn't look like that. I didn't think I would ever look like that or wanted to look like that. <clears throat> um, and so it just didn't really seem all that appealing to me. Um, and I've just since come to learn that, and you guys probably maybe through this series have learned as well, like that's just really not true. Um, but I think the another thing that I, I really didn't like about science, particularly in high school, is I thought it was just a lot of memorizing facts. And so at least the way high, um, high school science worked for me was that we had these big textbooks and you had a lot of tests and it was a lot of flashcards and I just didn't really think it was that interesting or exciting and the things that I got excited about were more like an English class where you were given an, a book and you had to analyze it and think about different connections and then write about that um, or do more creative writing where you came up with things and thought about how that would work and I, I really enjoyed that a lot more and now that I am doing research I realized that that's a lot more what research is like than just sitting in a book and reading these facts. Certainly you have to have a lot of understanding of the of the world to be able to ask good questions and think about it, but it's not like we all just sit around quizzing each other all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess I just wanted to put that out there as you know, if you're sitting in class and you don't really think that science is something that you're super passionate about or you're not the best kid in um, any of your science classes, that doesn't mean there isn't a space for you to be a really great scientist. And, you know, it's not the right path for everybody, but don't think that that is disqualifying you from being really um, well suited to it. So anyway, yeah, so moving forward to some of the stuff that I learned in grad school. So first of all, I spent all of my dissertation focused in the Arctic, but prior to grad school, I don't think I really knew what the Arctic was. <laughs> So I thought it was good to step back and sort of define what this area of the world is. And in my mind, when I thought of the Arctic prior to grad school, I thought of polar bears and maybe you do too. And I think we hear a lot about polar bears because they're undergoing a lot of challenges as our world is warming and their habitat is changing really rapidly because they depend on sea ice for hunting. Um, but polar bears and the Arctic Ocean and the North Pole is just really like a small part of what the Arctic is globally. So next slide. Um, yeah, so just to define that this is, there's a lot of different definitions for what the Arctic is, but this is just one simple definition. So this is, if you were looking down on Earth from the North Pole, so that white mass is what um, during the winters normally is frozen, um, although that's changing, but um, you can see that there's this dashed circle where it's denoting the Arctic Circle, and that's 66 degrees north latitude. And so the main definition of the Arctic is this really high northern area where during the winter it's extremely cold. Actually, during the summer it's often below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so still pretty cold. Um, 
Many areas in the Arctic um, experience total darkness during the winter, and that's one definition, that they have total darkness for parts of the winter, but then also absolutely no darkness during the summer. So there's um, periods of time there where you're, um, and I've been up in uh, northern Alaska where the sun never sets. It just like spins around the, um, the horizon, which is really weird. But as you can see from this map, it's not just ice and snow. There's a lot of land actually in the Arctic. And so um, that's where I've been focusing my research on primarily. So if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, this is what northern Alaska looks like. And so this is actually, I think this photo was taken in May. So this is not the winter because the sun's out um, and in the winter it would be totally dark. But you can see there's beautiful mountains and lots of snow. But then once that snow melts, next slide. It actually melts and becomes this really productive ecosystem. So lots and lots of plants, you know, plants love sunlight. And if you have um, total day, 24 hours a day, um, plants just grow like crazy. So they have this really short growing season where conditions are nice, but they're able to grow really quickly um, and um, actually suck up a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and then eventually that gets stored in the soil. So it becomes this really vibrant ecosystem in the summer and that's something that I just personally didn't know anything about. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So I guess I, I've sort of said what the Arctic is and why it might be kind of a cool place to visit, but why should we care about studying it? Well, I think one of the most compelling reasons is that it's changing really, really rapidly with climate change. And so this map is showing temperature increases. It's showing so how, um, how much warmer areas of the world are relative to the average um, between 1950 and 1980. And so red colors are showing um, larger increases in temperature. And so you can see that that area that I highlighted to you up in Alaska and northern Russia um, are warming really, really rapidly. So the Arctic has been warming about two to three times faster than the um, world as a whole. And so this is a, a part of the world that is just changing so quickly that I feel like we, we really need to understand how this ecosystem works and what these changes are going to mean so we can we can try and prevent them and um, just know what type of world we're going to be living in in the future. So next slide. But you, you might still be wondering, well, okay, but that's really far away from where I live. Do I really care about what happens way up in this part of Alaska that nobody lives in? Or, um, you know, I think there's there's plenty of reasons to care because, um, well, Part of what happens in the Arctic changes the weather where we live, but there's also lots of connections, not just through the climate system in the Arctic, but also through the biological system. So this map is showing the migratory pathways of just 13 bird species that breed in the Arctic. Um, and there's hundreds of species, everything from um, owls and hawks and maybe geese that you've seen, but also little songbirds that you might see in your backyard. Um, and so I think one thing that's really fascinating about this place is that changes that are happening there can affect ecosystems you can see as, as far away as Antarctica. Um, the Arctic Tern has the largest migration on Earth and it, it flies in between the South Pole and the North Pole twice a year, which is amazing in and of itself. But if you think about um, things changing in the Arctic, impacting the birds that live there, that will impact these ecosystems all over the world. And so I think it's really important that we understand what's going on there and how these birds connect up the various places and that, that we know and love and care about. Um, yeah, so next slide. So you might be asking yourself, well, why do these birds fly all the way up there? That seems really inconvenient. <laughs> and one reason goes back to what I had talked about before, where in the summer, these ecosystem, the Arctic becomes really productive. So the plants grow like crazy. And if you know anything about like the summer in New York, the plants come out, they start growing like crazy, and then there's bugs everywhere. Well, the same is true in the Arctic, but even more so. So this is a video that one of my friends took. Um, and you see, what looks like, I don't know, are they birds or helicopters? They're mosquitoes. They're just all really, really huge mosquitoes and they're everywhere. And there's so many of them that when you're up there, you have to wear, I don't know if you notice the person there, he looks like a beekeeper. And it's not because 
he's worried about getting stung. It's just so, so annoying. <laughs> and so when you're up there, you have to wear special clothes. We even sometimes wear gloves just because I've never gotten a mosquito bite anywhere else um, in the world ex on the palm of my hand, except for in Alaska, you get them all the time. <laughs> So yeah, it's not necessarily the most fun place to live, but if you're a bird, that's awesome, right? That's just all free food. Um, and there's also fewer predators, so they have more to eat and they're getting, they have fewer um, animals that are eating them. So it can be a really advantageous place to breed, right? And have your babies and um, grow them up really big. And then you go and you spend your winter somewhere where it isn't dark and cold all the time. Um, yeah, so next slide. Yeah, so how did it get there? It's, I mean, and it's amazing to think that map I showed, you know, there's birds coming from New York. I would have no idea how to get to Alaska um, from New York. So, and you think about too, they, they really have to time this. So if you were going on a big trip like this, you know, you would use something like an alarm clock or a calendar to decide and know when it was the right time to leave, but they don't have that ability, right? So what do birds use? Um, next slide. So birds actually mostly use the sun and they're queuing into the length of day. So like you might be noticing now, um, the days are getting longer, you know, uh, you can be out around seven or eight o'clock and it's still light out, but in the winter, you know, around five o'clock, it starts getting dark. Birds are actually really sensitive to that. And so they start queuing in on these details and they, they can, um, they start changing and preparing and uh, eating more food and getting, making sure that they have enough fat so that when they're flying that far, they have an, um, enough energy to make it. And then that's what cues their migration. Um, so next slide. Yeah, but then, okay, so that's when they leave, but then how do they know where to go? Well, we would use, you know, Google Maps. I feel like we're all um, addicted to using Google Maps now or, you know, um, but obviously birds can't use that. So what are they doing? Next slide. So we actually don't really know how they figured this out, which is something that's pretty exciting. Um, it's, we know that they do this, but we don't really know how. And so one thing that we think is, and it, it really depends on the species too. We think that some species learn it from their parents. So they're born on their breeding grounds and they follow their parents back to wherever they spend their winter. And then the next year they might follow older birds. Um, but then we also think, next slide, that they might use landmarks just like you or I would use. You know, they can see potentially big mountain ranges or rivers and orient themselves that way. Um, but that doesn't necessarily help you. You know, it, it still seems kind of puzzling. Um, one thing that we think they might use also, next slide, is that the earth actually is like a big magnet. Um, and so there's um, a magnetic field that's being emitted and birds we think might be sensitive to the magnetic field that the earth is giving off and that they're able to orient in the same way that your com old, you know, old types of compasses that orient the needle north based on the magnetic field of the earth. We think that birds might have an ability to detect that as well, maybe through um, having like little pieces of iron in their beaks. Um, but yeah, this is like still just a really huge mystery and we don't totally understand, you know, I think many species are using some combination and we, and we don't know to what degree any one of these is um, helping them find their way. So next slide. But they've obviously figured it out and they seem pretty good at timing um, when they get to their breeding grounds with a spring, but what happens when spring comes earlier? So next slide. So if you might imagine that in the Arctic, um, you know, it's really snowy in April and like that photo I showed you in May, it's still pretty snowy, but then as things start to warm up, the snow melts out and then next slide, the plants come out and start growing sometime in May. And then sometime after that, next slide, all these bugs come out and there's lots of food. And so next slide, um, birds are flying from really far away and they wanna get there in time so that they can, next slide, um, meet a mate and find a good place to set up a nest and then lay their eggs so that, next slide, their babies are born when the bugs are out and there's the most food for them to eat so that they can um, have enough food to feed their chicks 
so that the chicks can grow, uh, have enough time to grow and be strong enough so that they can make the flight back south. So next slide. But um, like I showed you the map before with the Arctic warming so quickly, springs are actually coming um, much earlier than they used to. And so all of these things are getting pushed back earlier. So the snow is melting out earlier, the plants are coming out and the bugs are coming out earlier. And so if the birds, like I told you before, are relying on the length of day, which is not changing with climate change, they might be leaving their wintering grounds at the same time and then arriving too late. And so um, my advisor used to describe this like if you go to the cafeteria every day at the same time, like you always thought that lunch started at noon and you go and buy your lunch. Um, but one day the cafeteria changes the rules and it opens at 1130, but you didn't know and you show up at noon, there might not be enough food for you, right? Um, and so how can the birds try and understand what's changing on their breeding grounds so that they can continuously keep timing their um, migration so that they get there in time? So next slide. Yeah, right. So they're coming. So I just wanted to show this again to remind you, like they're coming from places that are really different. Um, than the Arctic. And so they may be experiencing their own changes, but it may not be exactly at the same rate or even changing in the same direction as the Arctic. So New York, maybe winter, maybe spring isn't coming that much sooner. So how would birds in New York know to get to Alaska earlier? So next slide. Yeah, so we were, we were really interested in this question. Like, first of all, are birds changing when they arrive to their breeding grounds. Um, and so we went up to Arctic Alaska to do this. And um, the main point of a lot of my research is that it's really, really hard to count birds. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And um, you, know, you have to send a big team of people up to this really remote area and they have to go out every day. And in order to be able to do that at a lot of sites, it's just takes a lot of time and isn't really possible to have enough experts who know what they were doing to be out there um, for that amount of time. And it's not really that much fun, to be honest. You know, you're just sitting, waiting for birds every morning, counting them, marking them. Um, so what we wanted to do is develop a way that we could do this um, without sending as many people out there. So we thought, well, one way is birds make so much noise. Um, I'm sure you've all noticed like right now, like in the morning, the birds are singing a lot. Um, so we thought, well, what if we put microphones out? And then next slide, as the birds start to arrive, we'd be able to hear them. And then we'd be able to um, understand whether or not they're showing up at the same time or whether or not they're changing when they arrive um, in step with how the snow is melting out. So next slide. Yeah, and so that the really cool thing about this is that birds have really distinctive sounds like we're we're all really good at this right when you're out you can tell what a bird is compared to you know just background noise or any other of the street noises you might hear um and so this is showing what sound looks like um which is kind of a funny thing to think about but on the uh, horizontal axis is time so this is just a one minute clip and then on the vertical axis is the frequency and so these little red markings, next slide, that I'm highlighting here, those are actually the bird calls. And um, in the background is just the, the background noise of wind blowing, or in some cases in our recordings, we have rain and lots of other stuff. So we left um, five microphones out for five summers and basically had them re recording continuously. So when I started graduate school, my advisor told me I have over a thousand hours of audio recordings. <laughs> And we really want to know when there's birds singing in them when there, versus when there's not. Um, but obviously you can't listen to all of them because it would take forever <laughs> and be really boring. So we wanted to develop a way where we could identify when there are bird calls um, in recordings versus not. Um, and so I collaborated with um, another scientist who does a lot of work with voice recognition. So like what's on your phone or um, yeah, where, where you're able to talk and then the uh, your phone is able to understand what you're saying. And so we developed similar methods where we were able to pull out um, these bird vocalizations from these calls. Um, so the next slide. So then from that, this is what some of our results look like. So then we were able to look at how much basically bird singing or vocal activity there was 
um, per day. So in this um, graph on the horizontal axis is the date. So these are all dates in May and June. And then on the vertical axis is this vocal activity index. So just basically how much how much bird bird singing was going on per day. And then that black line is showing you. So you can see that it actually changes a fair amount between days. But then we also had data on the temperature and snow cover. And um, so then if next slide, if we compare between years, you can see that, well, first of all, these blue lines change, right? So the, the snow cover and when the snow is melting out really changed. For example, in 2013, um, the snow melted out a lot later than it did in 2012. Um, and then you can also see where these blue spikes are is where there were big um, snowstorms. And you can actually see that the, the vocal activity goes down really significantly when there's a snowstorm, right? So the it's snowing, the birds are all hiding and not singing. Um, but from this, we were, we were able to estimate when the birds actually arrived to their breeding grounds. And so next slide. And then by relating it to the environmental data, we were able to show that actually these birds in this area do adjust when they're arriving to their breeding grounds um, to match when the snow melts. So if the snow melts earlier, the birds show up earlier. If it melts later, they show up later. And that might seem like a simple result, but it, it's really interesting because how do they know that the snow is going to melt out in Alaska earlier? Um, next slide. Yeah, so that was really what motivated the, the next part of my um, research. So really what we would wanna understand is not just at their breeding grounds, whether or not they came earlier or not, we would wanna know what happened along the way, right? Um, and how they're adjusting to things and what are they picking up on that's telling them that they should go faster or slower. So next slide. So to do that, we used um, little tiny GPS units. So these are them. The little black part is basically like a, a little computer that um, talks to a GPS satellite and takes the GPS location. And then it actually also talks to a, an information satellite and uploads that information and then re-downloads it so that I, I just sitting in my computer at New York um, would be able to tell where these birds were without having to do any additional work. And what was really cool about these is um, we haven't been able to do this on many small birds because um, obviously a lot of them are really tiny and you can't just put like a smartphone on <laughs> a little songbird. It's too heavy for them and they can't fly. So um, we haven't had the GPS technology where the batteries were small enough to be able to allow us to do this. And so this was really exciting because it was the first one of the first times that um, we were able to put a GPS unit on small birds. Um, and see where they were going. Like we've always known that they they migrate between these different places, but we've never been able to track them along the way. Um, so next slide. So how do you put a GPS unit on a bird? <laughs> well, we made little like we called them backpacks, but they're little harnesses. So on those units before we attached um, string and then the string goes around their neck and then down their chest and through their legs and then back around. So they have this little unit sitting on their back. So this is me and one of my friends who helped me, who's really um, talented at handling birds because you, you have to know what you're doing and it's really delicate, but um, we're able to get this done really quickly. I think it took us um, about two minutes with each bird to get a backpack on and re-release it. Um, so this is really, really fun work, <laughs> although really challenging because you're basically sitting around waiting for birds to arrive <laughs> and then trying to catch them. And animals really, really do not care about you or what you wanna do. <laughs> and so there's a lot of just waiting and waiting, but it was really cool to be able to actually hold these birds and then be able to see where they're going and just amazing to, to, to realize that you're just catching them along this huge journey that they're taking. Um, so next slide. Yeah, and so this is one of our birds sort of triumphantly carrying his backpack, um, perching for us in a nice way. Most of the birds um, actually just end up um, flying off too quickly. But yeah, that's the little unit that um, we're highlighting there. Yeah, so um, as you can see, it's pretty low profile and um, these units weigh less than a dime, so it, it, it really shouldn't impact them very much. Um, and if you go to the next slide, 
Oh yeah, I just wanted to also share that um, we had a lot of kids involved in this project and so each of these birds was sort of adopted by a fifth grader um, <laughs> and given a name and they um, made these name cards for each of them. So as we were catching the birds, we were taking photos and then we were keeping a, a field blog, which also if you're interested, you can look up, but we were documenting what it was like to be um, doing research in the field and capturing these birds and then talking about the various things. So, and I thought it was really fun. Um, a lot of the kids came up with really cute names like Bertie Sanders and Wi-Fi and uh, yeah, anyway, that was a really fun part of this project. Um, next slide. Oh yeah, also um, <laughs> all of this work was funded by NASA, um, which you might be surprised to know that NASA funds research on birds. <laughs> um, but uh, this was part of a really big initiative to understand, NASA wanted to understand what's going on in the Arctic. And uh, we were part of a, a really big project looking at how um, all sorts of animals like caribou and bears um, are responding to changes and how they change their movements. And uh, like in the photo I showed you before, the friend who helped me out is, is a really talented artist. So she drew this um, space robin for us. <laughs> and so this is the sort of unofficial mascot of all of our research. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so I mean, it's really simple, but one of the really cool results of this work was just seeing where do birds go? I mean, we know that they end up in Alaska and we know that they, um, well, we were catching them in Canada, but we don't know how these ecosystems are really connected. Um, and so one thing that was really um, cool for us was just to get to connect the dots, literally. Um, and so this is a map of where our, um, we had 55 birds that we got data for um, over three years. And so this is a map of where they um, ended up going. And you can see maybe um, sort of towards the top left corner, um, one of the birds ended up flying over 2000 kilometers all the way up to the Arctic Ocean, which was really surprising to us. Um, another thing that was really striking is we do know that robins um, breed sort of in that in that area, sort of to the top right. But it was surprising that none of our birds actually went there. And so it seems like, you know, um, this type of work is helping us understand what that um, migration pathways are for this species. And so the birds that are um, breeding in that other area are coming from uh, um, different places. Next slide. Yeah, so um, one additionally cool piece is, so we looked at um, the, the place that we were capturing birds has been studying birds in that area for a really long time. And so basically what they do is um, during the spring, they go out every day and they count the number of birds that they're seeing. And so um, we were able to use that data to look at whether or not robins are migrating earlier. Um, and so this is showing on the horizontal axis the year. So going back to 1994, so over 25 years. And then on the vertical axis is the arrival date or the date at which um, 5%, 50 or 95% of the total number of um, robins that they saw came through that location. And we can see that, um, yeah, over the past 25 years, robins have been migrating through this area about 12 days earlier. So that might not seem like a lot to you, but um, in this area where the whole of summer is only about two months, 12 days is you know, basically half of a month. So that's um, a pretty large difference. So next slide. Yeah, so then we wanted to see, well, um, along their migration route, what's really like controlling um, whether or not they're speeding up or slowing down. And so we tried to relate their movements to environmental data on the um, snow conditions, temperature, and then wind speed. And so we looked at um, what's really driving these um, changes that we're seeing. Next slide. And we saw over and over again in the um, different aspects of their migration that they're really responding to snow cover. Um, and this, again, doesn't really seem necessarily that surprising, um, given that, you know, birds don't, it's, it's kind of dangerous for them to be in snowy conditions. It's, um, you know, could be too cold for them and that they could um, end up dying because they can't get access to food. So it's not that surprising, but we've never been really able to relate these types of movements to um, environmental conditions in this type of way. So it, it was really exciting for us to be able to see that 
birds are making decisions along the way during their migration that are maybe helping them accomplish the sort of long term um, changes in their migration timing that we're seeing. Yeah, so next slide. Yeah, so I, um, all of this research is um, still very much ongoing. And one thing that I wanted to say that is really exciting is that I have this goofy cartoon here of the International Space Station. So pretty recently, um, a bunch of researchers got together and um, you know, lots of people want to track animals for various different purposes to try and under, better understand how they're using their habitats or changing. And so um, they had astronauts place an antenna on the International Space Station that's able to communicate with animal tags. Um, and so we'll be able to better track animals um, more consistently. So you'll be able to put out tags on, you know, like the birds I was studying that will be able to um, have little solar panels so they can last longer. And so we can really start to track animals over the course of their entire lifetime. And, you know, like I said before, we're, we think maybe birds are following what their parents are doing or we don't really know how they're making, you know, how they know where to migrate. And once we start being able to track animals, you know, year after year, we can we can start to understand um, yeah, how much of that is driven by the environment versus what they're learning. Um, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a really exciting time to be interested in these types of questions. And I think we're just gonna really learn a lot more about how animals all over the world um, are changing and responding to um, our changing world. So anyway, thank you so much. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Ruth. That was really, really cool. Um, those visuals were great, simple, very clear. Um, and you got a lot of cool questions coming in. Um, so to start off, we had a couple questions come in about asking about, um, can you talk more specifically like how you um, capture the birds in order to tag them? How accurate is the GPS? Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, um, so to capture birds, we use something called mist nets, um, but I like to say they look like big volleyball nets. Um, but with really, really fine string. And so basically what we do is we know that robins, um, maybe you've seen this in the, in the parks in New York, they like to hang out in the fields and look for worms. And so we, we set up um, near a big field and then um, robins will kind of like hang out, they're looking for food and then they get a little bit flustered and they fly up into the trees. So we had this big field with trees around it and we put these nets all around and so they, they just look like big volleyball nets but um the the um they're so fine that the birds if they're looking at them can't totally see them and so they just fly into them and we're, we're standing right there so we go and capture them um and it's totally safe for them but yeah um <laughs> It's pretty fun. And then the accuracy of the GPS, yeah, they're, they're um, fairly accurate. It's about the same as like on your phone, um, maybe slightly less accurate, but yeah, especially for what we're doing, um, yeah, it gives you much more detailed information than we've ever had before. Cool, that's really awesome. Um, a couple other questions came in about the lifespan of these birds. So Maddie was asking, does migration affect the lifespan of birds? And another student was asking, if the environment that the birds are flying to has any effect on their lifespan. Yeah, certainly. So I think robins only live probably about five years. Um, you know, most of these birds or, or most migratory bird species are sort of, you know, that's the um, what they're meant to do. So I, I don't think it necessarily um, makes them live, you know, shorter if they if they migrate versus not. Um, but it's definitely a really energetically taxing, um, you know, obviously they're flying hundreds and hundreds of miles. So, and it, it can be pretty dangerous. So um, I do think one thing that we're really interested in is as the world keeps changing, is that placing more and more um, energetic burdens on these birds and potentially cha um, changing their lifespan? So we actually don't know. So it's a really great question. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, we're running out of time. There's so many questions. So um, hopefully, I think a lot of them were covered during your presentation, but maybe if we just look at one more, uh, one came in. I don't, I don't quite understand this, but maybe you'll be able to answer this more specific. It says, on the graph of arrival date and year, are the cyclic increases and decreases due to season? 
Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's actually not due to season because it's all happening in the spring, but um, it's due to these um, larger scale climate variability. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard about like El Nino or um, so it, um, the way that um, weather and climate kind of works is that we'll go through periods that are slightly warmer or slightly colder. And so that's what those um, big periods are picking up on. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ruth. This, I learned so much and obviously the students learned a lot too. There's a lot of great questions coming in. So thank you students for all those great questions and thank you Ruth, so much for joining us. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your time, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. That was incredible. I learned so much about our little feathered friends. Um, I've always been fascinated in birds and thought that if reincarnation is a thing, I'd like to come back as a bird. And your presentation just confirmed that for me. So really cool stuff. So we're going to make a, a hard pivot next from birds to something equally cool. Uh, drones and volcanoes. I think those are two in the two things alone are uh, separately are cool. You put them together and We've got a pretty cool presentation by Dr. Anat Lev, who's joining us. She's also, um, well, she's not also, she is from an associate research professor at Lamont Doherty Earth, Earth Observatory at Columbia. And I, we were talking to her yesterday and she's told us that in addition to her research, she likes to make volcanoes in a lab. So I'm very curious about that and learning more from you, uh, Dr. Anat. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here and a um, really great initiative. Um, I hope to tell you a little bit more about my research um, and other uh, and the research that other people in my discipline do and how drones are really changing it. So um, like the title said, uh, how to use drones, which is a term we don't really like to use. We mostly call them um, UAS or UAVs, which stands for unoccupied um, aerial vehicles or aerial systems, but um, drones is kind of the publicly famous um, nicknames that we use it. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to tell you also a little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in Israel. This is a picture of my hometown, Haifa, which is a beautiful hilly um, town on the coast of the Mediterranean. Um, and then I studied geophysics um, in Tel Aviv University and also combined it with computer science, which is a really cool combination because then I can use computers to study the physics of um, geological processes. Um, then I did my graduate degree um, up the street here in Boston um, at MIT, uh, where I looked into the physical processes that happened inside the Earth. Um, and then 10 years ago, when I moved to Columbia University, I switched to looking at things that are closer to the surface, um, really looking at physics and the fluid mechanics um, that go inside and outside volcanoes. That was about 10 years ago. Um, next slide. Um, so just to get everybody on the same page, uh, what is a volcano? Um, and its most basic definition, a volcano is a vent or a chimney that connects um, a reservoir or a chamber of molten rock um, from within the Earth's crust um, to the Earth's surface. And a volcano is um, includes uh, both the inside parts of what we call the plumbing system which can be sometimes pretty complicated with a lot of little pockets and a lot of little um, what we call dikes and sills and um, conduits. And then um, all the way up to the cone, which usually builds over thousands um, of years of more eruptions and layers and get built up on top of each other, um, all the way to the vent, uh, which is where um, the magmatic products, um, lava, ash, um, and can go out when there is an eruption. Um, next slide. Um, this is a map of the world uh, where we have a little triangle showing where um, all the volcanoes are around the world. And you see that we have most of them on this um, circle that it goes around the Pacific Ocean. Um, and this is uh, what an area that is called the Ring of Fire. It's very famous for having uh, both um, a lot of volcanic activity and a lot of earthquakes. Um, you see that um, it goes, stretches all the way from South America through North America, the West Coast, um, the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, 
um, Kamchatka, Russia, um, Japan, and then all the way down through the Philippines to New Zealand. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of volcanoes in other places around the world. Um, for example, you can see Indonesia as one country has um, probably the highest concentration of volcanoes. Um, there's also volcanoes in um, Europe, in the Mediterranean, mostly Italy, um, and as well as in Africa. Um, and all of these places, um, the Ring of Fire in Indonesia and Africa, and all of these places, um, also Iceland, if you see here, up um, in the Northern Atlantic, these are all um, places where two tectonic plates um, either separate or come together. And that's a place where we have a lot of activity, um, both earthquakes and uh, volcanic activity um, that combines, that is associated with those plate boundary processes. Um, in addition, there's also volcanic activity that is not on plate boundaries. Um, and a classic example of that is Hawaii here in the middle of the Pacific. Um, and this is an area where we have hot material that comes from the interior of the earth in the middle of a plate and just independently puncture it and creates volcanic activity. Um, next slide. Um, this is a cool map that you can get um, if you go to that <clears throat> this website and it shows you a, a snapshot of what is going on right now. And people are sometimes surprised to know that at any given moment there is more than 10, sometimes 20, sometimes more actively erupting volcanoes around the world. Um, this map shows in red just the past 24 hours um, of activity. And you can see Central America and South America have been really active. Indonesia and Kamchatka have all been really active. Uh, but also if you just look at the past couple of weeks, there's also been um, unrest, which is not quite erupting, but might be getting towards eruption. So there's always something going on, um, and it's important to appreciate that. Next slide. So probably it's not going to be news to any of you that volcanic eruptions are dangerous. Um, in this slide, I have pictures from the type of eruptions that we call explosive, um, which are uh, Characterized, characterized by these big um, clouds of uh, fine particles, what we call um, ash. And that um, cloud of particles can go all the way up to the stratosphere sometimes. You can see on the left um, a picture of the really tall plume, really high up plume that came out of Redoubt Volcano in Alaska. Um, and sometimes that cloud can also collapse um, and create what we call a pyroclastic flow, um, which you can see in the picture in the middle, where this poor vehicle is trying to get away from a very fast moving, very dense um, and really hot um, pyroclastic current. And these have very, very powerful uh, motion to them. You can see on the top left, um, middle there, uh, building that used to be there and then it got completely wiped out by pyroclastic flow. Um, another danger that comes from explosive eruptions is fine ash and that ash after it goes up in the atmosphere eventually settles down and on the right you can see pictures of houses and vehicles a church um, that were covered by thick layer of ash and even when you can sometimes clean out the ash, um, a heavy layer of basically glassy rock um, can cause a lot of damage um, and collapse building rooftops, um, but it can also interfere with things like um, airplanes and aviation. And once an ash goes into an air engine of an airplane, it can cause a lot of damage. It melts onto the engine and really makes it stop. <clears throat> um, also, ash is very bad for people's health. If you breathe or if it comes into contact with your eyes, it's very unhealthy. Next slide. Um, this is a map just to demonstrate, again, the um, red triangles of volcanoes and all the black lines are uh, global flight routes. And you can see that the global aviation industry, um, both people, um, 
uh, traveling and also cargo is heavily impacted by potential eruptions. So it's very important to give them a good assessment of when and where an eruption might happen um, and how it might or might not um, have to change the flight routes. Next slide. Um, another type of eruptions that um, we often hear about is effusive eruptions. And here the danger is a little different. Um, instead of having all this um, fine ash that goes into the atmosphere and interfere um, with uh, kind of breathing and aviation and, in, and houses, um, you have um, lava that comes out of the volcanic vent and then it goes around um, on the ground. And while it doesn't have this like big boom that sometimes people are mostly associating with volcanoes, the uh, effusive eruptions tend to last a long time and they also create permanent damage because once you have you cover an area with lava flows, it, it's rock, it's going to stay there. Um, here we have pictures from the 2018 eruption in Hawaii by a volcano called Kilauea. And in that situation, which was exactly uh, two years ago, um, there was a, a vent that opened, a series of vents that opened within a community on the southern flank of the volcano um, inside a town called Leilani Estates. Um, and you can see on the left a picture from before and then on the right a picture from after or really during um, the active eruption in 2018. And you can see how there was a lot of um, damage from the lava itself, um, just covering the ground, but also damage from fires. There was, um, a, Hawaii is heavily vegetated, uh, but uh, there was a lot of death of the um, vegetation by the toxic gases that come out of the um, volcanic vent, um, as well as just fires by the heat. Um, next slide. So here's, um, I just put a few more examples of before and after because it's so striking what happened in um, Hawaii. So this is another picture of Leilani. On the left, you can see um, the green rooftops of the power plant. This is a geothermal power plant that um, got threatened and actually had to close because of the eruption. And if you see the after picture in the next slide, you see what? So basically the whole town got covered um, and the power plant um, was pretty much saved except for the access road that got covered on the um, kind of left side of it. Um, but it was completely um, unsafe to keep it open. They had to close all the um, facilities and all that. But you can see how extensive that lava coverage was for the entire area. Next slide. Um, this is another town just further down um, on the coast from Leilani. It was called Vacation Land, and you can see all these beautiful properties um, that, was on, that were on the shoreline, really beautiful vacation houses and towns, and then a little bit inland, there was a lot of farms. Um, and then once the lava came, next slide, it was all gone, basically. Not just that it was all gone, um, also, you can see that the lava extended well beyond the shoreline because it was flowing into the water, into the ocean, and created new land and new rocks that was um, kind of making the island bigger, but also very unstable. So this whole area is, is really unsafe right now. Next slide. Um, one more of a before and after picture, just to really drive the point of why we study all these lava flows. Next slide. Yeah, this is um, this, uh, showing the vent. It's called Fisher 8. It's the vent of the um, where all the constant on the activity in the 2018 eruption got concentrated. And after you see on there's a kind of a diagonal line going across the picture and it's basically a crack in the ground where the lava was coming out of multiple holes, kind of a different hole every time. And then after a few weeks, it got all concentrated in what's called Fisher 8 um, and this big hole in the middle. And lava was coming out of that hole um, for another uh, few months. 
next. So I hope I convinced and I hope you already knew that volcanoes are dangerous and really want to understand them better. Um, and some of the questions that volcanologists ask is, um, first, when will eruption and eruption start? Um, it's very important to understand that and forecast that. Um, but also then, once an eruption started, where would the lava or the ash or the gas will go? Um, and how and when will the eruption end? And also to, uh, to better, get better at forecasting what future eruptions are um, going to do, we also want to understand what past eruption we're doing. So how can we look at deposits from past eruptions to understand what they were like, how long they lasted, how fast the lava was moving, how thick and how much ash was coming out, um, and how much gases were coming out. Because these are all things that impact the environment and they impact the people who live nearby, um, as well as people who live a little further um, out in the world. So there's several ways that we study volcanoes and I, uh, I'll show that in the next slide. So to observe volcanic activity and try to answer some of these questions, both when will eruption start and then once it starts, what is going to be like? Um, we observed several important things. Um, first is ground deformation. We look at how the ground moves. For example, if a volcano um, seems to be inflating, there's probably some pressure building inside it and maybe an eruption is coming near. Um, seismicity, which means um, little earthquakes that happen because if new magma or new pressure is building inside a volcano, they're going to get create cracks and these are all going to uh, be able to be recorded on seismometers just like earthquakes. Um, geophysical measurements, this is a general term that relates to things like is the magnetic signal of the volcano changing over time? Um, for example, if there's more fluids, if there's more cracks, if there's more magma, these are all going to uh, change how conductive or how resistive the volcano is. Um, and if we track those over time, we may be able to tell what's going on inside it. Um, looking at what comes out of a volcano is really important too. So there's multiple ways where we look at gases, we look at how much gas comes out, and we also look at what kind of gases come out, um, and that can tell us what's going on inside. Um, looking at the hydrology, uh, volcanoes have typically quite a few hot springs on them, and if we look at the chemistry of the water and the temperature of the water, that is also signal uh, can signal to us to what's going on inside. Um, so these are all in this picture from the USGS. It's a great picture that shows um, all these different types of measurements. But if you notice, they're all on the ground. And what has been happening in the last um, couple of decades is really um, explosion of uh, using aerial uh, types of observations. If we go to the next slide, um, there's different types of what we call remote sensing. And remote could include anything from uh, looking at from satellites, which what we have satellites looking at ground deformation and satellites looking at um, gas emissions from volcanoes. Um, and then aerial observations with airplanes and helicopters, um, which is uh, very effective to get data, especially during an eruption. And they can collect gas uh, data, they can collect gravity or any other kind of geophysical measurements. Um, and now, in really in the last decade, there's been a real increase in how people use drones um, or uh, these unmanned, unoccupied aerial systems. And this is what I want to focus on today. So if you go to the next slide. Um, this is an example of pictures that we took uh, during the Kilauea uh, 2018 eruption. On the left is a picture we took from the ground, just standing by this fissure, um, and we're standing on the ground at the power plant, trying to figure out what was going on and where is the lava going. Um, and then 
that gives you kind of a limited view. Um, it was also nighttime where the lava was uh, thought to be coming towards the power plant. So, and, and that meant that the helicopters couldn't go up because they didn't have night vision. So we got called into the scene. Um, and by we, I mean the uh, team at Columbia, with, and we're working with the University of Hilo, uh, of Hawaii in Hilo, who really had the authority from civil defense to come into the situation. And then we took the drones up and that's on the right is the picture that the drone took. So the drone can see not just the vent, which is that bright yellow uh, in the middle, but also the lava and how fast it's moving and where it's moving and where the channels are um, and all that. So it's basically drones can go places that people just can't um, and give you a very different picture of what's going on. Next. Um, another example is a place, um, this is a video uh, that you can see where the drone took pictures um, of a summit of an exploding volcano. And this is definitely a place, not only you can't go on foot, but you also don't want to go with a helicopter because the shockwave and the particles and the gases, these are all going to be very, very bad um, for any kind of um, aerial system and a small airplane or a helicopter that has people on it. Thanks. Uh, next slide. So the reason that drones are really coming into volcanology now is because um, mostly because the cost of using drones has come down a lot um, and they've become increasingly easy to use. Um, if before you had to pay many, many thousands of dollars to get a drone and then also have a specialized pilot to fly it, um, then now we have kind of consumer level drones that we can just give um, our scientists and our postdocs and students and they can pretty easily learn how to use them and get really excellent data um, in fairly low cost. Um, there's also proximity that we can, the drones can give you access to places that are close, um, much closer than you would get with, a, with any kind of any type of other instruments because you can just launch them and then they get close. Um, they provide safety. They give you the access to places that you wouldn't normally want to go. Um, they're fast. They can get data really quickly and cover a big area um, much quicker than anyone would be able to do on foot. Um, and then frequency means that you can launch multiple flights and look for changes um, that would be much harder to do um, just by, say, sending a bunch of people out there to make those measurements. Next. So drones come in a lot of different shapes and sizes um, from the tiny ones like the Mavic that you can see here on the left where we can just hold it with one hand and launch it and it has the cameras. You can stick a gas sensor on one of them. Uh, these, these things are really tiny um, and just launch it into the field. Um, then you can, uh, and that's really great because uh, volcanoes are a lot of time really difficult uh, places to access. So you want to be able to carry something in your backpack like that uh, white phantom uh, drone that I have here in the middle. Um, just put it in a small backpack, carry it into the field. You might have to be walking uh, several hours to go into the field um, to get to your area of interest. Um, and then you can cover a huge area with those drones just by sitting there and launching them out. Um, and then there's also the bigger drones that you have to launch uh, from sometimes a caterpillar kind of thing, um, like you see in frame D here, or you have um, all sorts of other uh, systems. And you can see here a range of pictures from all from volcanologists around the world that were using drones in different environments. Sometimes you have a road to launch from, sometimes you don't, sometimes you're out in a field, sometimes you have a flat area for landing. Some drones can land right down, just go straight down, uh, like those quadcopters. Some drones need a landing strip. So different models work for different applications. 
next. Um, so now I want to go over um, seven different uses that as a community we've done, um, we've used drones for in a volcanology situation. So the first is um, looking for disaster response or kind of a situational awareness situ um, case. So these are two pictures that we took during the Kilauea 2018 eruption um, on the left. Um, it's the UH Hilo and Columbia team on the um, Puna Geothermal Power Plant area with you see all the pipes and everything, um, holding the controller and launching the drone up to the air. Um, on the right is the same team, but all now surrounded by uh, the road crews. These folks were situated on Route 137, which was the first route, um, road, major road that got cut by um, a lava flow. And this picture was taken just before the lava um, got to the road. But in Hawaii, there's thick woods. You wouldn't even know that there is an eruption just, you know, 500 meters from you, um, except for the kind of orangey sky. So we will take the, the drone up in the air and show these folks this is where the lava is and this is how long we have till it comes to the road and you really need to stop people from coming through or you really need to evacuate the town that's down the street. Um, next. Um, the next application is just visual observations. We want to get better visuals of what's going on. This can be um, what's going on inside the vent, for example, like in this video. And that is kind of data that you're just not going to be able to get during an eruption um, without having some sort of a proximal and sometimes even sacrificial kind of instrument because you might not be able to retrieve some that some of this data or some of these drones uh, but you still get it and you don't want to sacrifice a helicopter with a crew on it um, and um, So here, for example, we see that, that there's one big vent, but the gases are coming out of uh, several different holes and there's different cracks and maybe having an eyes on it will help us understand um, when the big dome uh, that we see covering the whole vent, is this going to explode and give us a big, big, big eruption or are all the gases um, just escaping through those small holes? Because that's a totally different type of eruption, totally different size of eruption. Um, and it's good to be able to see uh, what is going on right at the vent. Next. Um, another thing that we use the visual um, pictures that we collect with drones is to build topography models. So using a technique called structure for motion, which is kind of like stereo imagery, if we take pictures of the same object from many different angles, you, we can um, create a three-dimensional model of that object. Uh, people do it for sculpture, for engineering, and we do it for volcanic topography. Um, and one of those, the really striking applications of that was again during the 2018 Hawaii um, eruption where the USGS and the Department of Interior had a drone team fly repeatedly over the summit of the caldera of uh, Kilauea volcano and they were able to create really high resolution um, topography maps of the, the top of the caldera with this big um, hole and in a hole inside it. Um, just for scale, you can see here on the top is um, this little structure here is Hawaii Volcano Observatory of the USGS, just to give you kind of scale of what is happening here. Um, so this is a past, uh, well before the eruption, 2008 topography model of that summit. And then uh, if you play the video, we can see um, kind of the time lapse of what changed. So while the lava was coming out on the south flank in Leilani and covering that town with lava, um, 
the summit was deflating and collapsing inside itself. So the multiple surveys can show you really the time lapse of uh, change in the topography of the summit and how it uh, was kind of falling down and collapsing. Um, most of these collapse events also caused earthquakes that were felt by the towns that, uh, and the villages that are close to the summit. So it was very important to see what the cracks were forming, where um, collapses are, um, might be happening next. Next. Um, another popular application is thermal observations. It's very important uh, to know what the thermal signal of a volcano is because sometimes the first thing you see is that a crack opened, but it's hard to see just visually. It's all kind of gray, um, but you can see that all of a sudden you have an area that's hot and that tells you that maybe there's hot gases coming through or hot magma coming closer to the surface. So. Um, we equip a lot of those drones with thermal cameras um, and they capture the infrared um, emission that comes out of the hot objects. Um, so you can see in those, this video, uh, we'll see kind of flying around a, a lava, a volcano summit, again showing the hot deposits that came just in a recent eruption. And you can tell really easily um, in the thermal when something hot comes out. You can also see the gases and the circulation inside of the gas flume. And you can see what the older parts that are uh, showing in kind of colder shades that the purplish um, and the hot part that are young that just came out of this last explosion are in those bright yellows. If you look at it in the visual picture, like in the left, it's very hard to tell because it's all kind of the same shade of gray. Next. Um, this is a thermal camera video that we took um, from that same road spot that I showed with the crew earlier. Um, we took the, the thermal drone up and you can see this is after the lava has actually crossed the road and entered into the ocean. So we see the really striking thermal signal, or hot uh, kind of area that formed inside the ocean. And that is something that's really important, for example, for um, understanding the impact of the eruption on biodiversity and the ecology of the coast area. Um, you can also see the channel itself in this bright yellow. And then once the lava hits the water, really a tall plume of what's called um, lays or lava haze, which is um, really fine glassy particles that uh, when the lava hits the water and crunches into really tiny particles of glass um, and toxic gases that all come and circulate into the air. Um, and that's something that you really don't want to get an, air, um, an airplane or a helicopter anywhere nearby. Uh, what was also interesting when we saw, took that video was that we were able to detect that the lava flow split. You can see two branches coming in, and that meant that it was actually coming way closer to the road crews um, that initially was predicted. Because initially, when they looked at the lava earlier that afternoon, they only saw that one main branch. But then we were able to tell them in the middle of the night, really, um, look, there's another branch you want to move uh, your, your crew. And Inat, you have about two minutes left. Right. And then you see the drone landing um, on, on the road. So the road uh, keeps the heat so it's easier to find it um, on the thermal camera. Next slide. Um, another really important application is measuring gases. Um, you can fly drones and put them, uh, put on them gas sensors, uh, very sensitive for uh, carbon dioxide and sulfur and uh, halogens that all come out through um, volcanic eruptions. Here we're going to see a drone going straight through the cloud. And again, that's definitely not something you want to do with anything else. Um, and unlike satellite observations, for example, we just give you the top view. Here you can see the three-dimensional structure of that gas plume. And 
once it comes out and you read all the data, you can make plots like we'll see um, in the next slide. Here, it actually made it. You can see the vent and this bright orange and all the gases coming out. If you skip to the next slide, you see all these tons of data points that show you what the gas concentration, in this case, sulfur dioxide, um, that the sensor on the drone was collecting. So you can see going from clear air in the blue to really high concentrations, 80, 70, 80 parts per million. And just so you know, toxic for people is anything above 10. So it's really not a place you want to go yourself. Next. Um, people also uh, um, deploy geophysical instruments on drones. For example, in this case, they were mapping this lava dome in Nevada, and the surface expression, as you can see on the left, is um, marked with a white contour. But then if you put a magnetic um, sensor on a drone, you can map it in really, really high detail and see that underground, it's really much bigger. It's that uh, kind of dashed line that goes around it. Next. And really exciting application is using drones to sample. After the 2018 eruption, um, the crater that used to host a lava lake now hosts a water lake. And you can see on the right that lake that formed and it was important to understand what kind of water was coming uh, into it and it, how acidic, how hot it was, see what it's doing over time. So you can see the video in the next slide. It's a little hard to see right now, but there's a drone in there. It's right there and then it's going down into the water, holding a bottle and sampling the water. Here's the drone. It's descending into the crater. The water is very toxic. The gases coming out are very toxic. So really a drone is the only way they can do it. And then it collected the water and then it went out um, and got the scientists the samples they needed. And there is also drones that collect ash and collects particles um, and sample other types of deposits. So the next slide. So hopefully I convince you now that drones are really making a revolution in volcanology by providing access at times and places that were inaccessible until now. Um, the examples applications that we covered is disaster response, mapping and documenting, um, looking at topography and detecting changes, um, making thermal measurements and gas measurements and uh, making geophysical uh, surveys and lastly sampling. Next. So this is the uh, end of my presentation. I will be happy to take questions now. Awesome. Thank you. That was super cool. And you got a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> I bet. Um, so the first chunk of questions, a lot of people, you mentioned sacrificial drones. So Vicky and Therese were all questioning, like, have you lost drones in the past? Like, how do you get their data? Uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about um, losing drones, maybe? <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. Um, drone volcanologists are pretty honest about the situation. I mean, I think almost anybody either lost a drone or almost lost a drone. I once um, wasn't paying attention and I flew a drone into the side of a volcano because I didn't estimate the height too well. Um, luckily, we were able to, to go up there and rescue it, um, but it was a little sketchy. Um, there's definitely been drones that were lost in places you couldn't get to them, um, into the craters and you know, volcanoes. Um, but yeah, I mean, we try not to, because these are, uh, even if the drone itself is not that expensive sometimes, um, often they carry things that are more expensive, like a thermal camera um, can sometimes cost more than the drone itself. Um, or the, if there's a specialized gas sensor or geophysical sensor, um, you don't want to lose that. Uh, but it's definitely a risk that we take, um, which is why uh, sending the data back while it's flying um, is Inat, Inat, uh, you're accidentally on mute. 
Oh, no. Sorry. You didn't hear anything I said? Uh, just the last little bit. Oh, okay. About the data coming back. Yes. But that's where so, we're at. Yeah. So um, drones are able to send the location, but also some of the data back. Um, with pictures and videos, it's a little tricky because it's a lot of bandwidth. But if you're just sending the number of a gas concentration, it's very easy to send that back while you're going in. So it's even if the drone doesn't come back, um, you still have the data, and that's really important. Um, also, we have the practice of after every flight, we um, replace the memory card. So even if it goes bye bye the next flight, um, we still have whatever we recorded before that. That is very cool. Um, I think we only have time for one more kind of set of questions, but you also had a lot of questions coming in about kind of like studying the history of volcanoes. So there were some about like, is there, have you noticed more volcanic activity now than in the past? And have there been any um, volcanic eruptions that have had a large impact on our climate in the past? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there hasn't been any particular increase um, in activity. It's been pretty steady. Um, there is sometimes an increase that we see after the end of ice ages. Uh, for example, in Iceland, after the ice cap got removed, there was uplift and some of the magma that used to be under pressure was able to get erupted. Um, but for the most part, it's pretty steady. Um, there have been several notable eruptions that changed the climate. Uh, Mount Pinatubo, Mount um, Tambora, they all had very big um, climatic effects. Very cool. Thank you so much. I'm sorry sure. we can't get through all the questions, but um, thank you for all of your information. This was really, really great. Sure, thank you. Yes, Anat, thank you so much. It's uh, great to see the visuals you have and to learn more about how drones are used uh, to help us understand more about science in the areas we can't reach. Um, keeping with that theme and thread of drones, we're going to turn now to our, our next speaker, uh, a virtual ride of discovery exploring the, the Earth's climate using drones. Uh, his name is Dr. Chris Zappa. He's also a research professor at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia and uh, had no word for a treat here. We met with him yesterday and I saw some of his footage. So uh, looking forward to learning from you, uh, Chris, and seeing some of your footage. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dad. You can hear me, right? Yes. Great. Um, first of all, I apologize. I'm going to be looking down at the screen. My camera's up there, so if I don't be uh, alarmed. Um, <laughs> and also, I'd, lo I'd love to... Um, Shout out to Ina on a great presentation and actually a, a great introduction to what um, I'm going to be following on with other applications of using um, drones and, and slightly larger drones than, than the ones that Ana's used. Um, but many of the same um, instruments and maybe a few more. Um, so I just like to um, acknowledge the, my team at Lamont. Um, They've worked with me from the beginning, Scott Brown, Tess Jakal, Ryan Harris, um, uh, postdoc Nathan Loxog, and a graduate student, Carson Witte. And a lot of this has been really generous funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And NASA helped me get this started a long time ago um, with some work in the Arctic. But today, you can go to the next slide now. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about um, ocean surface temperature. And um, I think many of you know, have heard that you know, climate change is real. And one of our ways to um, measure and observe climate change is in the ocean. And we're gonna focus on two areas today. One is the lower circle there, the green circle. Yep, exactly. That's near Fiji, um, and we're studying specifically there, we're studying how um, surface slicks or cyanobacteria blooms, algal blooms, material on the surface enhances um, ocean warming. And it's a, a kind of a hot spot, pardon the pun, um, but <clears throat> it allows us to study a process that is applicable in other parts of the um, of global oceans. And then we'll move up to the Arctic and see how this warming of the ocean is impacting sea ice um, 
in the Arctic, and specifically how that changes in the sea ice affect local communities, specifically indigenous communities. So let's go to the next slide. So here's a zoom out that's Fiji right there. <clears throat> you go to the next slide. So in um, our first um, um, work in Fiji is was aboard the RV Falcor. And this is a research vessel. I do a lot of my work in, on the ocean. And um, we go on vessels like this. You go to the next slide. And Fiji, this is just another shot of the where Fiji is, but more zoomed in on all the islands. There's lots of little islands around there. There's, um, and it's very calm, as you can see from the ocean. It's it's always calm. It's kind of over, um, partly cloudy typically, but um, very calm. And we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this is um, a little movie about what the project we were working on in Fiji. Um, it was fun. Um, supported by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And we use these drones, these large drones that can take off and land directly from a ship, that can fly about 50 nautical miles away from the ship um, and for 15 hours at a time. And we're looking for these slicks right here, trichodismium slicks, and I'll show some more pictures after the movie. Um, and we take samples, we use catamarans um, to take those samples. We make measurements from the ship using spectrometers and radiometers. We put things in the ocean like this buoy to measure upper ocean salinity and temperature. We use what's called the CTD, conductivity, temperature and depth uh, measurements, um, which was that rosette there. And we start from looking at a satellite and we zoom in and look at temperatures um, on much finer scale from the using the aircraft and from the ship. And we use do this change in scale from satellite scales to near the ocean using the drones. That was mission control there. Um, here's the drone on the deck. We're taking our sensors up to the drone here and gonna mount them before flight, do all our preps, takes off and lands like I showed earlier. And it flies around and tries to map out areas where we see um, these trichodismium slicks. So there we find a slick and in mission control, we take all the equipment back out of the water and the catamaran, the spit, <clears throat> the drifter. And then we go to where the slick is and put it back in the water. So we're steaming along with the ship <clears throat> when we put things back in the water and the everything is sampling now that specific area. And the UAVs um, can sample the whole area very quickly. Um, this is sampling of pumice. This was like an undersea volcano. So similar to what Anat was talking about, we have undersea volcanoes and we saw the pumice come to the surface and we could measure that with the UAV flying over. Um, and then we see a temperature signature of this ocean surface warming. This is one of my grad students, Lena Miller, who's talking about the really high resolution temperature structure that we look at. So there'll be some images here in a second. But from that temperature structure that you see there, we can understand how the ocean is warming, how different processes impact that warming. So we're going to specifically look at this trichodismium slicks. <clears throat> and then it kind of, you can see the aircraft just kind of hover down, land on the, um, on the ship, and the ship kind of continues on its way until our next mission. So the beauty of this is that we have this, this platform, this UAV, this drone, that allows us to go out on the ocean and find the features we're looking for. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so we're back in Fiji. Next slide, please. So if we go to, if we're out there on the ship for they say 30 days and we, go and we go to all these different locations, but it takes a long time to, you know, you're going very slow on the ship, but the UAV allows us to um, cover vast regions of um, the ocean and target in on the specific process we're looking for, in this case, a trichodismium bloom, and then go and sample it 
um, repeatedly in over a long period of time. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a picture of this trichodismium. Um, and it covers vast areas of the ocean. Um, if you go to the next slide, it shows a picture of what it looks like under a microscope. So there, <clears throat> there's the, on the right hand side is a picture of trichodismium um, under a microscope. And it's these long tendril um, sticks, we would say. I'm not a biologist or a microbiologist, so um, there was someone else on the project that was focused on that. But on the left, you can see this bar chart that set, shows right at the surface, there's lots of trichodismium. And then just below, there's a little less. But if you just go just a few feet below the surface, there's hardly any compared to what there is on the surface. And this change in, in how much material there is on the ocean surface affects how much heat is absorbed by the ocean. So if we go to the next slide. From satellites, on the left you see is a satellite image, and that shows all these slicks from a satellite. Um, and on the right, it shows what the chloroform, chlorophyll, um, chlorophyll, chlorophyll um, map is relative, related to that trichodismium patch or slicks. There's lots of tendrils all over that whole image there. Um, so one thing about satellites is they're very infrequent. You know, they come over for this one maybe every once, a, every couple, you know, every seven days. Um, and often it's very cloudy. Um, so this is a very rare occurrence of a nice clear day where you see nice uh, cyanobacteria bloom. But even when you use the satellite data on the right, it gives you a, a result that's all those white areas are bad data. Um, and that's basically because the algorithm doesn't understand what it's seeing on the, in the trichodismium, with the trichodismium bloom. If you go to the next slide. So as I mentioned on the, on the, in the, Movie. We have the UAVs. We fly continually. We have um, a buoy that measures the temperature and salinity and the trichodismium at the surface. Um, you know the next slide. And so there's the there's the buoy in the water with the ship in the background. Going to go to the next one. And as I mentioned, from mission control in on the ship. We can go and look for where those trichodismium patches occur. So we, you know, we're guided by the satellite image. We go to that region, even though it may have been seven days before, we can go to that region and start to look for it. Go to the next slide. So we, we fly around. Next slide. When we find it, we pull everything out of the water. Go ahead, next slide. And then we go back to where we find where it is. So on the left, we put the stuff back, the spit back in the water. And we see it's you see that patch of trichodismium right there that it, that the that the buoy is going through, and it can measure the ocean heating or warming due to the slick. So how it changed from where we were before to where we are now. So we can see how much more heating there is from the ocean in this location. Let's go to the next slide. So there's a picture from the from the drone that shows just how vast these slicks are. And the little yellow thing right in the middle is the spit buoy, and the, there's Valcro on the right, and there's the the research or the uh, over the what they call the rib, the rigid inflatable boat that goes over over the side of the workboat. You go to the next slide. So with the with the imager with the with the drone, we can map out these where these slicks are and how extensive they are, and then so that's on the left. That gives us what the visible imagery is and um, on the right shows the temperature response using that infrared camera that similar to what ANOT was showing um, and it shows us the direct heating that's due to these these um, trichodismium slicks. So if you go to the next slide. So if we find from the buoy we can see how much physical heating there is. So from the drone, you can see the spatial extent of these slicks and how much heating there is. And from the buoy, we can see exactly how much heating there is in the near surface. And on the top there, it shows how much trichodismium. You can see an increase of trichodismium with time. And on the bottom, you see the same thing, only in temperature. You see the increase in temperature with time corresponding to the same increase in trichodismium. 
And one other thing, you can see that orange area and that on the lower plot, how different it is from the red area, the dark maroon area. That's the model is the orange. So the model is not predicting what the actual temperature is. So our whole goal is to improve these models of heating that would then feed into weather models or climate models. So if you go to the next slide. So this is a great tandem of, of or use of drones where you have use the drones as a scout, find the process you're looking for, and then put your other instruments in the water and map out the whole region with the drone. So if you go to the next slide. And so that's going to conclude our first our part of time here in Fiji or in the ocean near Fiji. And there's, whoops, <laughs> that's OK. So now we're leaving Fiji. We go to the next one. Go back to the map. So we're going to leave Fiji and we're going to go up to Alaska. Um, and we're going to look at, I'm going to just briefly show you what the pathway is for the water that we see in near Fiji and how it may get up to Alaska and um, and impact the this, the warming that occurs in the equator, how that may impact the, the change in sea ice up in the Arctic. So we go to the next slide. So the ocean surface has these very complicated surface currents. And if you look at the region there, so there's Australia, just to the right of Australia, this is that Pacific South Equatorial Current, and that goes from east to west, so a little further up north there, up near the equator, so that goes east to west, and then it goes, crosses the equator, and then goes back from west to east, and then goes um, up to the Kuroshio on the left, by exactly, by Asia, and then it goes, keeps going north, up to the North Pacific Current, and that keeps going into the Alaska Current, and that takes the water into Alaska, into the Bering Sea, exactly, right up there, perfect. So if you can go to the next slide. So now we're going to zoom out from Fiji and we're going to head up to Alaska and zoom in there. So the water's passed, traveled all that distance, and now we're up in Alaska. So if we go ahead down to the next slide. In Alaska, we're looking at how we bridge the scientific and indigenous communities to study sea ice change in the Arctic Alaska. And this project is called Ikagvik Sikakun which is Inupiaq for ice bridges. Um, if you go to the next slide. Next, hit it again. So in Alaska, in the Arctic in general, sea ice thickness is decreasing over the last 40 years. Um, if you go to the next slide. And this impacts local communities, indigenous um, cultures. Next slide. And it could impact flooding ghostly. Next slide. It could you know, cause erosion. Next slide. It impacts the marine mammals habitat in the next slide. And in specifically in our case, it impacts the traditional life of the indigenous people. Next slide. So the project goals for this project in Alaska was to understand sea ice dynamics and specifically how it is changing with the warming climate. And most important to this top project was bridging scientific and indigenous knowledge to study these changes in sea ice to lead to better predictive models for the sea ice loss, impact on ocean life, and the impact on land mammals. Next slide. And from a science perspective, we want to understand the mechanisms, the impacts, the implications of this sea ice changes. And from a community standpoint, we want, to, we want to develop partnerships between scientists and the local residents um, to increase the capacity of local communities to address the research, their research needs. Like what are they interested in? And the legacy is to document the progress of the project um, as, a, as a future model for community-based collaborative sciences, science endeavors in the Arctic. So you go to the next slide. So we're in Kotzebue, next slide. There's Kotzebue in Alaska. We're going to zoom in. So here's Kotzebue Sound. We go to the next slide. Go ahead and toggle through. So here's we have a code production of knowledge. And one of the key um, questions is what are the processes of, of sea ice processes um, that impact Kotzebue Sound? So go to the next slide. So this is a satellite images of what the sea ice is in Kotzebue Sound typically. So you can toggle through the next one. 
and then bam. This, so this is the last, in 2018, you see this much less ice in 2018 than there was before. And the next slide, and even less in 2019. So the last two years have been really anomalous years that we've been up there, that we've been, that we've been able to study. So if you go to the next slide. So just a quick, go ahead, next slide. One more. Keep going. All right. So this is this is what the sea ice cover is for the typically for the last um, twenty years or so. Go to the next slide. That's what the sea ice cover in the Arctic was in twenty eighteen. Go to the next slide, and that's what it was in twenty nineteen. So you see, in twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen in Kotzebue Sound, it's much less than it was in previous years. You go to the next slide. So this shows what happens when it's warming in the spring. So you can see um, the green, the red is already gone. So and then the, the green is, is melting quicker than it was for the blue, which is previous years. So you can go back again. So we want to study what this melt process occurs and how that impacts the, the traditional um, communities. Next slide. So the Alaska Coastal Current that we talked about earlier, there it goes up the coast. Go to the next slide. So that brings the warm water from the equator that we talked about in Fiji. And after it passed through all those um, other um, surface currents. And then the Siberian coastal current brings the cold water out of the Arctic. So the next slide. And you can see just looking at the at the surface, you can see this this exchange of water between that, in that narrow bearing strait. On the left is the northward moving warmer water, and on the right is the southward moving cold water. So next slide. Keep going, next slide. Next slide. So as you can see here, there's that warm water that's coming up the coast and it's going into the into Kotsubu Sound. You go next slide. So the region we're talking about is Kotsubu. That's the Kotsubu Sound. And it's um basically it's an Inupiaq community of around 3,000 people. Um, and it's it's important habitat for ringed and bearded seals, which is part of the um, a tradition of um, the Inupiaq people. Um, if you go back, next slide. And we were studying specifically in the spring um, in general. If you go to the next slide. So let's actually stay there one second, sorry. Right. So you can see there's a cycle in the temperature throughout the year. In the winter, it's very cold, um, and then it gets warms up in the spring, just like it would in here and wherever you are uh, in the world or in, in the northern hemisphere. Um, and we want to focus on this this warming trend right there in the yellow band, where that's where the typically the, the melt occurs, the sea ice melt occurs. So go ahead, next slide. So go ahead, next slide. So there's a great interest in the marine mammal use of the sea ice. So marine mammals use the sea ice themselves and the, the Inupiaq people use this um, as a tradition. They hunt uh, marine mammals. Next slide. Um, so it requires um, measurements of the sea ice and the momentum balance. So next slide. And it also requires specific local measurements of the sea ice fracture and movement of the ice. Next slide. So here's again is the average what the sea ice looks like in 2000. Next slide. Here's what it looked like in 2019. So there's hardly any um, ice compared to previous years. Next slide. If we focus in on Kotzebue area, go ahead. Next slide. <clears throat> Keep going. Next slide. So that Alaska coastal current comes in. Go ahead. Next slide. And next slide. We can zoom in and we can see, um, make some measurements on the ice itself. So next slide. The and we measure. We want to understand what the relative roles of the ocean, river, and the atmosphere are. Next slide. And so we measure. Keep going. Toggle through. So we measure the ice thickness. We measure the temperature of the water. We measure the currents in the water, and we measure the atmospheric measure, um, uh, properties. So wind speed, temperature, um, whether it's raining or not, or snowing. Um, next slide. 
And when the water comes from the ocean, it's salty. Next slide. And when it comes from the rivers, it's fresh. So there's rivers that empty into, into the Kotzebue Sound. Next slide. Uh, Chris, you have about five minutes left. Perfect. Thank you. So the water has it's, it's stratified, so which means it's um, there's a gradient in temperature, so it's warmer, it's colder, deeper, and gets warmer as you get up to the surface. Um, so next one. And that's we, we're going to look at this temperature gradient and then there's there's motion in the water, which is mixing, so it mixes up the water as well. Next slide. And if we just look at the temperature and salinity of the water in the winter, so this is January, in the winter we see whenever the salty water comes in from the ocean, there's a warm, warm water comes with it. So this warm salty water comes in in the winter time. Next slide. So the ocean is the primary source of this heat that we talked about from the Alaska coastal current that comes in and is providing heat to the ice in the winter time. Next slide. So we can also look at how what happens this river water I mentioned what kind of an impact it has so next slide. So we put a measurement not only do we have measurements on the ice we have measurements out um, on the northeast northwest part of the sound next slide that measure temperature and, and currents just the same. And so there's the rivers and it comes down the channel goes over the red dot which is the which is where the measurements are on the ice and the water and then the blue dot which is the measurements of where the water and currents are in the ocean or the near the exit. Next slide. Yeah. Keep going. It's easier to. So in the fall, the temperature and salinity are tied together. So the fresh water, when the fresh water comes from the rivers, the temperature is cold. Um, and then in the spring, when the fresh water comes in, the temperature is warm. So in the spring, the temperature of the ice breaks up typically because the water from the from the rivers is warmer. So go to the next slide. That's probably what it just says there. So, ups, so the, the two rivers exert a primary control in the formation and breakup of this land fast ice. So this breakup of the ice is really critical because that's where that's where the seals are and that's where the hunters want to go. So next page. So if we look at keep going. So we're going to look at quantifying the surface properties, and this is where we use the drones. So as Anat was talking about in her, her talk, where you know you go where you use drones to go where you can't go, um, just like in the in Fiji we go 50 nautical miles away from the ship. Here we want to go on the you know measure the ice because we don't want to go out on the ice because it's not really safe. So the next slide. So here's a picture. Here's a movie. You can see the drone. They're zipping it over. Right there, hope you can see it. It's flying across, there it is, yep, exactly. Um, up over the ice, um, and then it's gonna head back over towards the village. There's the village in the distance there. So there's the Katsubi sound, the ice over the Katsubi sound. Next slide. And if we go page through, we start early in May, there's all that sea ice, and then the river starts to outflow. And then by May 14th, there's that huge piece of ice that just breaks away. So the ice has become so unstable after this warming of the river water that warms up the ice and thins the ice, eventually breaks apart. Um, and there's no way. Okay, next slide. Go ahead, next slide. So we do a couple things. One, you can go to the next slide. So these are measurements of we want to measure like how much heat is absorbed by the by the um, the um, ice. Next slide. So these instruments measure both the thermal energy and the sun. Next slide. And it tells us keep going, keep going, and it measures something called the albedo. So it tells us how much heat is absorbed by the ice. And if you the, the purple line on the ice there shows the track of where we were flying and you can see along there that the albedo is 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 plummeting which means it's absorbing more and more heat um, faster and faster so this is accelerating the breakup next slide so if you go keep going so that's why this occurred there was this acceleration of the of the warming of the ice or the and because of um, both the river and the 
al albedo were changing that accelerated this breakup. Next slide. <clears throat> so why is this all important to the indigenous community? So the indigenous community is very is a tradition of hunting seals um, for sustenance, literally for sustenance and, and the meat and the blubber. Um, if you go to the next slide. And local community elders, we had community elders working with us on this project that actually defined what our research objectives were. We we're very closely with them. And they're very concerned about the history of their, their livelihood or not, their, their traditions being lost. Um, so we go to the next slide. And one of their concerns is that the the Ugric is one of the is the bearded seal. And over the last 20 years, the number of days that they can go out on the ice safely has decreased. Um, go to the next slide. And so the number of um, the end and the end of the of their hunt season happens earlier every year. And you go to the next slide. Um, the breakup occurs earlier every year. So all these things in confluence are impacting the safety. There's a big part is the safety and the traditions of the Inupiaq people. Go to the next slide. Summarize, this is it. So traditional knowledge holders, the, um, the elders, can greatly strengthen the science through the co-design of these, of these hypotheses. Next slide. UAVs. Um, are powerful, flexible platforms for environmental sensing. Next slide. They operate where human observers cannot go safely. And next slide. It allows us to make observations of physical processes connected to sea ice throughout the breakup and melt when you wouldn't be safe to go out on the, um, on the ice. Next slide. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, but you can also email me. Um, feel free. You can also check out our website on on the Fiji project. That's that RV Falcor one, air to sea. And also check out our website on the um, Ikavik Sikukun project in you know, Kotzebue. And if you want to see any of the videos that you just saw, um, there should be on my uh, Vimeo site. You can go check them out there and additional videos too. And if you see if you don't see a video that you want to see, let me know and I'll put it up there. Um, and then you can Twitter me or tweet me, whatever you whatever that is. <laughs> I'm still learning about Twitter. All right, thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Chris. That was really cool. It's cool to see the connection between how observations in Fiji, how do they connect up into the Arctic? That's very cool. Um, so you had a few questions coming in. So Isaac was wondering. Do you buy your drones or do you make them? Ooh, that's a good question. So my background is in engineering when I was an undergraduate. Um, and you know, I always had fascinated with um, aerodynamics, but I buy my drones. <laughs> Those are the drones that I'm using are very um, high tech and that would that's that would be a a career in and of itself if you wanted to go in and develop drones themselves. So I work with a company directly and um, develop these drones to, to fit our needs. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Um, so you talk about in your presentation how uh, sea ice affects the organisms that depend on the ice themselves and the people that depend on the ice. Right. But Therese was wondering, um, how does changing ocean temperatures affect the organisms that live? There? Ooh, that's a really good question. So again, I said I'm, I'm not a biologist. But um, as we as and I didn't talk about this in this in, the, in this talk at all, but my background is in, in air sea gas exchange. So air sea CO2 exchange, how much CO2 is taken up by the ocean and. Ocean acidification, I don't know if you've heard of heard of this before, but ocean acidification is a real issue. And as you get more CO2 in the ocean, the oceans become more acidic and it becomes um, less of a um, in the long term, it's not good for ocean organisms, whether it be microorganisms or fish. For instance, where I grew up, place where I grew up, up in uh, New England, in uh, Boston, which are where I got my love of the ocean, um, where we love our lobster up there. And 
as oceans as the oceans get more acidic, they the shells that the lobsters or other shellfish need to grow are less and less viable. So over time, as the oceans become more acidic, there'll be less and less potential shellfish um, in certain regions. That's just a small one one example, but there are a number of other examples as well. Thank you. Um, we don't have too much time left, but there's two um, shorter questions that came in that I want to mm. ask. So Benjamin was asking, um, can you just define that. Yeah, <laughs> what, um, what trichodesium means? What um, it means? Ooh, yeah. You know, that was back. Like I said, I'm, I apologize, Benjamin. I am I'm, uh, not a microbiologist. That's why we when I work, it's very collaborative. Um, so there's lots of experts that um, that bring in different expertise. But if you go back in one of the slides, pretty far up in the trichodesmium, there was a specific definition of trichodesmium. And I don't want to butcher it. Uh, I'd rather read it verbatim. So I'll defer to that slide. You're going to prevent you're going to provide these slides, right? Yes, we will. OK, OK, yeah. great. But while while um, Lisa's toggling back up there, I can answer another question and then come back to that trichodesmium. Yeah, so Ali also just asked, how much time do you spend in the field and what's it like to get used to the cold climate in Ooh, Arctic? Great questions. Um, how much time do I spend in the field? I spend, so whenever we go to sea on the ship, we go at least, we spend time at least 30 days on, on the ship and we never see land. Just spend 30 days on the ship. I've been on cruises that were for 60 days and we never saw land. Um, and it gets long, it's, it's arduous, <laughs> but you love it. You know, it's, it's wonderful experience. Um, so I may do three, I may do two or three of those cruises a year. So I may spend maybe three months of two or three months of the year at, at sea, literally. And then up in the Arctic, we go, we spend like a month up there um, as well. So at last year I spent about three or four months literally in the field. And is it how how is it like what's it like getting used to the cold? As I mentioned, I grew up in Boston and I love the cold. So to me, going up to the Arctic and going to the Antarctic is actually exhilarating and I and I it's not really hard to get used to it. I'm I would rather be in a colder climate than in a warm climate. So when it gets hot and muggy here in New York, I would rather be in the Arctic or the Antarctic. Oh, and here's trichodesium. So I don't know if you can see that, Benjamin, but um Oh, this is really technical. <laughs> Benjamin, I apologize. I'll have to get back to you on that. Maybe you can email me and I'd be happy to get more information on trichodesmia for you. But it's basically it's, it's basically it's basically a specific form of cyanobacteria. Um, Does Benjamin get a point for stomping the professor? <laughs> of yeah. course. <laughs> of course. I don't know if Benjamin's a young a young kid or a or a I don't, or, I don't know either. Or a teacher. <laughs> but um Depending on the price is different depending on your uh, if you're, if you're, your age bracket. <laughs> I think the important thing, though, Chris, is that trichodesium is an is an organism in our oceans that's natural, Correct. and you guys are able to kind of track where it blooms yes. or grows, and then that has a really big effect on the actual uh, surface temperature of the ocean. Exactly. And the way that you were relating it, or at least from what I understood, was that these surface temperatures, the, the temperature of the ocean is actually carried throughout the whole ocean. So what was once warm in uh, you know, the area of Fiji will eventually right. make its way up to the Kotzebue Sound yes. and therefore help um, ass or assist, I shouldn't say help, but assist <laughs> in, in the melting of sea ice. Right. right? Uh, yes, correct. So it's, it's So really the ocean is all interrelated. Exactly. Very much so. Well put, Lisa. Thank you for rescuing me. <laughs> and so, Chris, when you were speaking about sure. slicks earlier, yeah. it's slicks created by this trichodesium. Is that correct? So specifically, we were we were looking at slicks created by this trichodesium. You can also have other other microorganisms that generate slicks. Um, so you can have like a, an oily surface on the an oily that's what I'm most familiar with is an oil slick. So that's there are oil slicks, correct? Yes. As a natural thing. This is a natural slick, yeah. correct? This is a natural slick versus, an, and even oily slicks can be natural as well because some 
some microorganisms excrete oily substances, carbon-based substances, right? Okay. Well, great. Eliza, any other questions? No, I think that's about it from us. All right. Thank you. Chris, thank Thanks, you so everybody. much. Uh, we've been around the world today, out in the Arctic twice, and Fiji, and volcanoes <laughs> in various places. I, yep. I thank you so much. Thank you guys for rounding out this series for us. This is great, great um, thing you guys are doing. I appreciate it. Well, appreciate your expertise. We are privileged to have you. Thank you. Um, and for all of our audience, thank you for being with us today. Um, I was thinking, reflecting back on this and how unintentionally we didn't realize it at the time, but when we set this up, we had sort of a theme of aviation today between the birds and the um, drones. So it's pretty neat to look at all those different aspects of science and how there is a connection. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Um, if you haven't already, please follow our office on Instagram. Uh, you can see the handle there. And I want to also, again, advertise our resource portal. That's where you can eventually find a link to this, but you'll also find a link to it and a follow-up email you'll receive from our office on Monday that will have um, this whole presentation, a PDF of the slides, uh, and also a quick survey. We would love to hear a little bit about who you are and what you took away from this so that we can continue to improve these series. Um, and the last thing I want to is just promote our next upcoming live event. That's going to be in two weeks from today on June 12th. And we're going to celebrate and honor World Oceans Day. So we're working on our lineup right now, but everything will be have an ocean theme to it um, because World Oceans Day is Monday, June 8th. So the Monday of that week. Um, so stay tuned for this coming week. We'll have more details on that, but I wanted to go ahead and plug it now. And we look forward to seeing you back here again at our next live event. Thanks so much. Enjoy the weekend and stay safe.